So welcome to a new week. Actually, the week is almost over when we have our lectures here. The uh, topic this week is to try to wrap up the discussion we've been having about these resampling techniques. And then uh, we're actually going to jump into a new topic. And this new topic deals with classification problems, but still it's going to lead to what we normally call a deterministic algorithm. And the classical, one of the classical algorithms for classifying uh, data is given by logistic regression. And you will see much of the same machinery and many of the same uh, equations and the way of thinking, which we have seen in linear regression. So these are going to serve as a kind of stepping stones uh, towards a very important aspect in machine learning, which is optimization. And we are in logistic regression, we are going to encounter cases where we cannot find nice analytical solutions for the estimators or the parameters beta. And we would have to solve this numerically by calculating the gradients of the cost function or loss function. And this leads to the whole machinery of the optimization problems with the gradient descent methods, stochastic gradient descent methods, and so on. There's a whole plethora of uh, ways of optimizing your cost function. But before we move on uh, to, that, to the new topic, we're actually going to look a little bit back at the, what we did last week. So let me just try to move on the slides here. So the, uh, uh, we are going to look at the summary uh, of uh, the regression methods. And in particular, we're going to take a look at uh, uh, the cross-validation method, which we mentioned last week. And now we're going to wrap it up. And then when we're done with that, we are going to move into uh, logistic regression. And there are a set of references which you can see here, which you can always look up if you want more in-depth material. Uh, I should also say that the, uh, uh, on the labs, uh, we still have two weeks uh, for the uh, handling of the project. So there should still be plenty of time for wrapping up the project. And I hope everything, as far as we can see from the lab sessions, it seems that everybody's basically on track. We tend to be flexible with deadlines, so if things happen, we can always push it till over the weekend. But uh, this would obviously interfere with the next project and, and work on that. So the topics which also come today are not directly related to project one, uh, but we are actually going to start project two with uh, taking what we had in project one and instead of uh, using an analytical evaluation of the parameters beta like we did in Ridge or standard ordinary least squares regression, we are going to calculate the same quantity numerically by using gradient descent methods. And that's a way to get a feel of what the, these optimization techniques actually mean. Any questions so far about what we have been covering, things which are unclear? Feel free to... Uh, Okay, so let me uh, go quickly back to uh, uh, the Jupyter books, which we were looking at last week. I'm just gonna share the, the Jupyter book with you. So if you go into the Jupyter book for this week, if we now look at this uh, cross-validation, so cross-validation is one of these more popular methods. Uh, Cross-validation is included by default in basically all the machine learning algorithms you will meet. The scikit-learn has cross-validation included. You will typically see an acronym like CV when you see a function in uh, scikit-learn, and that means that cross-validation is included. Now, the way you do that, and as we've been discussing partly last week, is that you split your data into so-called folds. Uh, you redistribute them randomly, and then you train your data on a specific number of these folds, and then you have a final one, which is used to test your model. That produces an estimate. It, with that one, you can calculate, for instance, the mean squared error, and then you would repeat it 
with the folds which had not been included in the test calculations, and then train a model again, recalculate the mean squared error, mean values, and other expectation values you're looking after, and then continue till you run through all the folds. So let me just quickly remind you of uh, uh, the cross-validation scheme, and let's then move into the, uh, to the whiteboard. So if you uh, look at the cross-validation scheme, the uh, standard approach here, so cross-validation, the standard approach is you divide your data, you reshuffle uh, randomly. So the k-fold way of doing it is that you can specify, let's say, a k, which typically is normally in this order of from 5 to 10. So if you now specify something like k equal to 5, and suppose this is your domain of the data which you want to fit, then you would uh, typically split it into five slots here. One, two, three, four, five. And in the first time, you could think of this as a training slot. And let's put labels, one, two, three, four, five. And then you would train. Again, you would train here. And you would use the final one for test. So your training on these different uh, uh, data sets gives you one model, and then you apply it to your test data, which is supposed to be the unseen data. This is a little bit different from the way you did the bootstrapping, where you actually just leave uh, test data forever outside of your training, and then you keep doing the bootstraps. Now, the motivation here is actually you want to uh, get a better measure for the mean squared errors and expectation values. So what you can show here is actually this goes towards the correct value for the mean squared error, if you know the distribution. However, uh, it depends very much on the amount of data you have. And one of the things you're going to see in one of the examples which are on the slides is that depending on the number of data, you will see that the results will vary from the number of folds you're using. So your mean squared error, for instance, can change as a function of number of folds. And this is something you need to test. So if you have very little data, your results may actually be sensitive to this number K, which we put up here. So every time you do this training, uh, you test your model on the test data. And then the next iteration, so this would be the first time, so you would calculate an error here, error one. Let's just put, let's write this as a number one instead. It's much better. So this will be number one. And then you produce an error on your test data, error one. And this is on the test data. And then you would continue with a new test set. So you could think of this being your test set. And the remaining slots are now the training data. And then you would produce an error two here on the test data. And then you continue till you actually gone through uh, all the slots with test data. So that means in this case, we had slot one and five. And now we go to the next case, you can put it in slot two, three, and four. So you reshuffle the data randomly. And then when you've done this reshuffling, in this case here with five folds, you will actually do this five times. If you have 10 folds, you will do this 10 times. And this then continues down to the last case where you could now have this one as your test data, and you have a train, and train. So it seems that I can't count properly either, right? Because this, this became six.
And this will be your final error or your mean squared error, depending on the quantity you're calculating. It doesn't need to be the mean squared error. It could be other quantities you're calculating. And then your estimated mean squared error, estimated, is now given as the sum over all the cases you have. In this time, you have, in this case, you have five cases, i equal one to five, and then you would have this epsilon error of i on the test data. This is a typical procedure for you running the cross-validation calculation. Now, you can write easily your own program for doing that, reshuffling the data into different folds, and then calculating the different quantities. And I'm going to show you an example on how you can actually write your own code and then compare that one with scikit learn. So in the slides, these are the examples which you will encounter. And the uh, thing you have to be a little bit careful with when you run uh, this cross-validation is actually to test that the mean squared error stabilizes as a function of uh, the number of folds. So if you have very little the example, which I'm going to show you now, is an example where I have not very much data. So the data file contains something like 150 X and Y values. And what I'm doing in this specific case, I'm putting a polynomial and I'm using uh, ordinary least squares and also ridge regression. So let's just uh, take a look at that. And so this is a, a very simple uh, case where I have uh, here at, at first I actually take a, a, a simple polynomial and in the uh, uh, down here in the next example which you see I'm actually reading some data file where I'm where I'm constrained to use the amount of data which I'm provided with but the first example here is a case where you can actually produce uh, as much data as you want and in that case, it's very useful when you're now implementing your own cross-validation to actually check that your mean squared error stabilizes as a function of the number of folds you have. So that's a, a very useful thing to look at. Now, in this specific case, uh, when you're writing codes, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, functionality included in scikit-learn. And there is a function here which I actually used, uh, which is called k-fold, and that performs actually the, uh, the splitting of your data. It sets up the way you should split data. And then uh, what I'm doing here is actually to run a, a, a double loop, since I'm using, uh, in my specific case, I'm using ridge regression, and I'm running over a series of values, lambda, and then uh, I'm performing now the splitting into train and test. And every time I do that, I obviously now perform the fit. And when I've done the fit here, I produce a test result. And then I produce the scores. Uh, in this specific case, I'm actually calculating the uh, mean squared error. And I'm simply putting everything into an array where I now have the uh, uh, an array as a function of the uh, train and split, which I did here. And then I simply calculate and estimate the, uh, the, mean error, the mean squared error by taking the scores from all the folds, summing them up and dividing by the number of uh, folds, which I did. And then if you want to use scikit-learn, for instance, scikit-learn has a, a functionality here, which is actually pretty easy to use. So here I run over ridge, and it's a very useful way to test your own code. If you want to write your own code, it's not so difficult to actually do that. And then you can now see that the scikit-learn has actually this uh, cross val score, and it takes your uh, ridge estimation here. It feeds in the uh, ridge uh, calcul the, the ridge setup with a given value of the hyperparameter lambda, and in this case, I return the mean squared error. And I have a given number of folds here, which is in this case set to five. So it's, it's a useful way actually to test uh, your own code uh, with uh, what scikit-learn gives. And actually in this case, the, uh, the blue line and the one from, uh, uh, the one from uh, scikit-learn and the one which I, I wrote 
they give uh, results which are exactly the same. Now, in this specific case, we are also keeping the, inter the intercept. We haven't done any specific scaling, no nothing. So this is just a plain demonstration of the uh, uh, K-fold implementation in scikit-learn. And the thing you have to notice is like, you can see now that for specific values of lambda, uh, you have a uh, mean squared error, which is pretty small. And then you can actually get into regions where the mean squared error actually gets even smaller as a function of lambda. So it's not given how this function is going to behave. It's not something you can say a priori before you run the calculation. And you probably notice that in project number one, when you run with the ridge regression or lasso regression, that depending on the data set you have, you don't know a priori where you will get the mean. Does that match with what you guys are seeing? Okay, so in this particular case, you would then say when you now are fitting uh, your model that the case with lambda being close to 10 to the first or between 10 to the first and 10 to the second, this is a case which gives a mean squared error, which is pretty small. However, this will, as you have noticed when you're running project number one, that this will actually change from data set to data set. If you have less data, this feature may actually change if you have more data. So if you run this simple example and just increase the data set, so if you now just remember this figure here, so we got the mean squared error around two here, and that drops to uh, close, closer to one when you have a lambda of 10 to, the, uh, 10 to the first. If you now change the number of data points, so suppose we put a thousand here, then this may change. And as you see here, it actually did change. So the results you're getting, they will always, always depend on the data set. So that means that a priori, you cannot tell what is going to be the best value for lambda. Now, you, another thing you need to check when you're using this cross-validation is how the error changes as a function of number of folds. And typically, all practitioners, there's a kind of rule of thumb based on, uh, uh, how to say, practice. You typically, people uh, use a K value which uh, goes from 5 to 10. So if you now uh, try to rerun it with, uh, with 10, you will see now that in this specific case, actually, the behavior, the mean squared error is basically the same value, and the behavior is pretty similar. If you now, however, move on to an example where you cannot generate new data again and again, you may experience a situation like this because in this specific case, so I'm just reading in some data for energies as a function of density, and I want to make a polynomial fit to the uh, energy. This is a physics case, energy per particle as a function of the density. And in this case, I have something like 150 data entries. So these are the data which I have, and I'm basically stuck with that data. So if I now run the case uh, with a, uh, a given set of, uh, of uh, k-fold trials, so I can, always, I can always change this. And you can see now that in, in this specific case here, uh, when I run, so there's first a case where I have the standard uh, ordinary least squares. But then the interesting example is the one where we use cross-validation. So let's now run it with uh, five folds and see what we get. And now I'm fitting a polynomial up to degree 30. In this specific case, it seems that a uh, polynomial of degree five is the one which does the best job. So I use cross-validation from scikit-learn here and simply just find the best possible mean squared error as a function of lambda. So this is what it's picking out here. And then I have a, a mean squared error which seems to be pretty good down. So this is a log 10. Actually, it's not a very good, it's not a very good uh, model which I've made. If I now change the number of folds here, suppose I take uh, number of folds equal 10 and just rerun it, you will see that the results, uh, previously it was the, uh, still around five here, but now the error is much smaller than in the previous case. If I 
increase the number of folds. So I can go up to, let's say, 30. What you will see now is that the, uh, there seems to be even a, a mean squared error, which is actually much smaller than the one I had previously. Previously, on a log scale, it was 10 to the 2, so 100, which was a pretty large mean squared error. When I now increase the number of folds, what it means actually, I have less data for testing and I use more data for, for the training case. And in that case, when you have a little data set, uh, these are kind of things which you may experience. So if this convergence to some kind of a value, then you would say, okay, this is the number of folds which works for this data set. But you don't know that a priori. So these are things which you have to play around a little bit with. So for the first case you have, I mean, the Franke function, I mean, you can produce as much data you have. And you would be in a typical data uh, rich uh, situation where you can uh, easily play around with not so many folds. But when you have few data points, then you have to pay a little bit more attention. In general, you should always pay attention to these things. So the, uh, when you're running uh, your calculations here, uh, you can always make the fit with ordinary least squares. You can change this and uh, as you can see with the example which you have up here, when you're running this with a ridge regression, you will have a loop over the hyperparameters lambdas. And that means you need also to figure out which model, and when we say which model, it's not only the complexity of the polynomial fit, but it's also the hyperparameter lambda. So you need to tune the hyperparameter lambda and pick the one which gives you the best mean squared error on the training data, and then you would use that on the test data. Now, if you have lots of data, many people tend also to split the data into train and validation. And validation is used to pick the model which has the best hyperparameter, which gives the best mean squared error. And then when you pick the model on the validation set, you would use that one on the test set. So you could think of using cross-validation, uh, but testing that with a validation part. And then at the end, you would apply that specific model to your test data. So that means that you would split your data first into train and test. And when you run cross-validation, then you take and feed in the train data and that train data is the one which cross-validation reshuffles for you into train and test. But in that specific case, test becomes validation set. And when you have a specific model which finds the best hyperparameter, then you apply that to your test data. But that's a typical situation which you would use when you have a data-rich environment. If you have few data, most practitioners tend to just split the data in train and test. So questions about many of these things, things, yeah? Uh, use that model. Yeah. Is that the model with the lowest uh, cross-validation metrics for the error? Yeah. 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 So not like the average of the data, for example. No, no. So, so normally you have, a, you have a score, which you, so the question for those of you online is what, uh, what, is, what do you use as a kind of measure? to figure out which is the best model. And you would typically have a set of scores like the R2 or the mean squared error. And many people use these. And then you look at the optimal, the model which gives the best mean squared error. And then that's the one you would keep as your optimal model. So when you're running calculations with Ridge and Lasso, you will have results for many hyperparameters. So people would often use a grid search or just set up a grid of hyperparameters. And then you pick for each model, so you have a fifth order polynomial, you would pick the model then, which has the best mean squared error as a function of the hyperparameter. So machine learning, I mean, it just, sooner or later you have to get used to the fact that when you deal with machine learning, you have many additional parameters which you can fine tune. And these hyperparameters, which you have in Ridge and Lasso, are typical examples of parameters which influence your results. So when you train, you need to think of fitting the data to also the parameters which give the best mean squared error. And that's your best model. 
for that polynomial degree. And when you move to another polynomial degree, that may change, and so on and so on. So the example which I showed you here, if you go down this uh, example here, that did not have a hyperparameter lambda. So when we looked at this one, this was just a plain ordinary least squares with no hyperparameter. So if you then were to include ridge regression, you would have to repeat this for the hyperparameters as well. Okay, any more questions about the, uh, uh, the kind of procedure? So this should give you uh, basically the ingredients which you need for the first project. Yeah? Can we do this for many different values of lambda? Yeah. 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 Now, if you if you look into the slides, I think it's in the slides next week. There is also an example where you can use Scikit-Learn's grid search op option. So Scikit-Learn will then try to find the optimal parameter of lambda. But the standard way, which many people actually use, is that you set up the grid of values. So, like in the cases I've shown you in the slides here. You have a value from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the first. And then uh, you simply pick those val models which have the lowest value for lambda. And that's where you do the model selection. And then you do the model assessment on the test data. So you have the training and validation part where you do the model selection. And then you have the model assessment on the test data, which was not included in the training. So these two steps, model selection and model assessment, are the basic and standard procedures in all these machine learning methods, which we're going to deal with. When you come to neural networks, we're going to do exactly the same, all deep learning methods. You're going to have lots of parameters. And as you will see today, we are going to introduce a new parameter pretty soon, because we will not have situations where we have analytical expressions for the estimators or the parameters beta. And this is already the case when we look at logistic regression. So if you don't have any questions about the project or what we have done till now, I thought of jumping into the next topic for, for this in this semester, which is logistic regression, and which then brings us over from us fitting a continuous function to a classification problem which means essentially that you have discrete data. And the standard example of discrete data and the most common one is the classical yes, no, uh, true, false, etc. So that's a so-called binary case. And that's the one we're going to look at. And what you will see then is that we actually need to rethink a little bit the way we think of our data sets. But let me bring up uh, uh, some of the uh, more motivations and, and for, the, uh, for what is going to come here. So I'm just going to give you up give after these uh, slides here. Uh, let's now look at classification problems. So in linear regression, uh, what we have done is essentially to fit a continuous function. And we've made an assumption that the data can be fitted in terms that there exists actually a continuous function which describes our data. Now, uh, when you have classification problems, you end up with uh, discrete variables, or they often called categories. And a typical example, so on the basis on some DNA sequencing for number of patients, you would like to find out which mutations are important for certain disease or based on scans of various patients' brains, figure out if there's a tumor or not. So that's a typical yes, no case, true, false. And numerically, you uh, convert always these cases into numbers. So true can be equal to one, false can be equal to zero. So that's the way you would actually encode that information. And the, uh, the typical table of data would contain results like yes, no, for instance, but when you read it in, you would have to convert the yes and no's to zeros and ones. Or if you have more categories, you need to convert them into other ways by which you can recognize what this actually means. 
And the standard way of doing that is actually to convert everything into bit strings if you have more categories. If you have just two categories, the binary case, it's pretty easy, it's just zeros and ones. So the, uh, uh, another reason why we uh, use uh, logistic regression as a stepping stone towards neural networks is that logistic regression is the case where we have a pretty simple expression for the gradients. Still, we cannot solve it analytically. So the, uh, it's an excellent way combined with linear regression to get a kind of feeling of what these optimization techniques actually mean. So as I said in the beginning of the semester, both linear regression and logistic regression, they serve the scope of uh, bringing in uh, these elements in a kind of more pedagogical way before you dive into deep learning methods like neural networks. Okay. So the basics here is typically you have uh, some classes of uh, responses or the outcomes Y as we've been calling them, and they are discrete. And the most standard one is just yes and no, or zero and one. Now, what you could do uh, is actually to, uh, uh, if you, let's now look at a, a specific example. So this example here actually is a typical example of yes and no. And what it's doing, it looks at the data for coronary heart disease as a function of age. So in the code here, which you can also run on your laptops, we have classified whether a person has coronary heart disease and output one or not, output zero. And this output is plotted against the person's age. And if you look at the figure here, this is how your data uh, this is just a data set, and this is how it will look like. So you would obviously expect when you get a little bit older that there is a higher likelihood for coronary heart disease. And when you're younger, the likelihood is normally much smaller. And what this actually lists, as you can see here, you can see that the age distribution of the yes, I mean, you have coronary heart disease, actually comes up at a, a little bit higher age. Now, if you want to fit, if you now think back to what we have done in uh, linear regression, you could now fit a straight line here, right? There's nothing which hinders you to do that. So what would be the typical problem when you make a fit uh, using linear regression and suppose you fit a straight line? So the value of x, which values can they take if you have a uh, continuous function? In principle. You can obviously fit that, that data with a straight line. There's nothing which hinders you trying and doing that. It's going to be garbage, right? I mean, that's obvious. But the, the, uh, uh, if you think of the x's and the values you would produce, your y's, the x's would go from minus infinity to plus infinity, in principle, if you don't put a constraint on them. That means that the way we have done linear regression, it means that y, if you have a straight line, would also go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So you would actually have a line here which goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. But your y values, they are just between zero and one, right? So we would actually have to rethink the way we are going to make the fits here. Now, one thing you could do is to look at the mean values. So instead of uh, uh, plotting the discrete data points here, you could then just calculate the mean values for each age group. So you could take the different age groups and then these are the mean values for each age group and you see that clearly the mean value is higher the older you are. So if you do that one, if you plot the mean value, this takes a kind of S form here. So what, what I'm trying to try to motivate a little bit is the kind of way we are going to parameterize the data here and the kind of model which we're going to make in order to be able to describe discrete data sets. So remember now we have made an example where we have zero or ones as the outputs. So what you could say here, if that value is less than 0.5, you could say that you exclude coronary heart disease. If it's larger than 0.5, then you could say you have coronary heart disease. So that's one way to interpret this data set. 
But let's go back a little bit to the, uh, to the whiteboard here and see if we can make things a little bit more, uh, how to say, more meaningful here. So let's now bring up a new topic here and just call it logistic regression. So when you bring in a new topic and you guys are all focused on project number one, so most likely is going, what's going to happen is that everything I'm going to talk about today, tomorrow, next week, is going to be forgotten because you're going to be so busy with project one and then you will have to bring it back again to life when we begin with project number two but hopefully you can forgive me for bringing up a topic which is not the main attention of you guys right now but we're going to need it later so that we can actually progress and start with project number two as well so if you think of what we have done in linear regression what we did is simply to have a linear model in the unknown parameters beta, but we could have a complex model for the, uh, uh, for the way we fit it with the function which we want to fit. So we have a y of i, which is now given by this sum over the xij's, the design matrix elements, beta j, plus this normally distributed noise. And where we have an epsilon of i, which is normally distributed with zero and sigma squared. And if we just have a, a, a straight line, this will simply be given by y of i. We have a beta 0 plus beta 1 of x of i plus an epsilon i. And in principle, if we don't put any constraints on the domain here, it means that the x of i's go from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that means also that y of i is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the basic assumption we have made is that we have a y of i, which is now given by this f x of i plus some epsilon of i. And we've been approximating this with a function x of i, y tilde, plus an epsilon of i. Now, f of x is a continuous function. But now we actually need to think of data which are discrete. So the kind of approximation which we are making now is that we are going in logistic regression, since this is a classification problem, and we're gonna stay with a binary problem. Then we are going to have to rethink, so f of x of i should represent discrete data. So we're going to stay with the binary example here in, in this lecture and then tomorrow we are going to look at how we can uh, modify this to more classes. So in this case we have a binary example which means that y of i takes only two values. It could be minus one or plus one, but let's put it to zero and one. So these are the only two values which uh, y can take. And we would like now to uh, find a model which can reproduce it. So instead of thinking of a continuous function, what we could think of is that there is a probability distribution or likelihood. So f of x is now replaced by a function p of x, which is a likelihood. And if we now look at the, uh, uh, the kind of functions which we could have, I mean, you can always make whatever kind of example you want, as long as it is something which can be normalized in the domain of events which you have. So 
a, a typical function, which is often used for this one. If you now look at the data sets which we have, so we will have a domain of X values, and we have the Y values here. And you could now think of uh, this uh, Y values being described by, so we have a one, which is one possible event, and then we have zero here. So these are the two possible values. And now you could think that we have some kind of function which perhaps looks like this. There are many ways of doing that. Uh, it's not doesn't need to be a function like this. It could just be a step function. It could be that when x is above a certain value, then it's one. When it's below a certain value, it's zero. So another possibility could be something like a function like this, just a step function. That's another possibility. Or you could have functions which are uh, either broader or sharper around a certain point for x. And typically what you would say then is that if x for x smaller than a specific value, then the output is zero. And if x is larger than a specific value, then the output is equal to one. So a typical function which you will encounter in many, many applications here is an S, you see this kind of S shape, which you also saw from the distribution of mean values. And one of the more popular ones is actually this P of X. And if we now assume a linear model, which something which goes like beta plus beta one, the unknown parameters times X, divided by one plus E of beta zero plus beta one times X. So this is normally called the sigmoid function, and many of you have probably seen that. And it's one of the standard functions which is being used in the activation of neurons in neural networks. So this is just one example, and you can easily see that this is a function you can normalize as long as you have a finite domain for, uh, for x. If you look at this function here, you know that you can calculate the integral. So one of the requirements from a probability distribution in a given domain which you're looking at, the of x, is that this is something which can be normalized. So if you look at the function uh, which you have here, so let's just simplify it a little bit and just write it as a p of x of e to the power of x of one plus e to the x, you know that you can easily calculate this integral. And now I'm not specifying the integration limits because you would have to be a little bit careful with that of d of x, and this is something which is given by the, if we don't have any constants here, this will simply be given by ln of 1 plus e of x. And now you obviously have to be a little bit careful about the limits, because if you let x go to infinity, then the exponential of infinity and then in the, in the log is going to be infinity. So you need to have a finite domain. But this is a function which you can normalize and treat as a probability distribution. So this is just one of the many, many examples which you will encounter in the literature. And what we are going to assume now, the basic assumption, is that instead of having f of x over y of x is now given by this probability distribution p of x plus some noise epsilon. Now, uh, the p of x, so we assumed in uh, linear regression that we had a continuous function f of x, and now we're going to assume that there is a probability distribution p of x, and then we're going to make models for this p of x. And this kind of uh, sigmoid function or logistic function, it's called, is just one of many examples. So we are going to find a specific model here. In our case, we make a P of X, which is going to be approximated with this function E to the beta zero plus beta one times X divided by one plus E of beta zero plus beta one times X. So that's an approximation which we make. But the assumption is now that the uh, data is described by a probability distribution plus some random noise. Now, we haven't specified the noise yet. So what kind of noise should we expect? Should that be a normal distribution? Or maybe, or maybe it should be another distribution. And this is so, these are things which we're going to see after the break. 
So after the break, we are going to uh, describe how we can model and find the optimal parameters beta. And keep in mind also that in this expression, which you see here, you don't need to stop with beta zero and beta one. You can have more terms. There's nothing which hinders you uh, in actually having more complicated models in the exponents uh, and arguments to the exponents. But now I just put up the simplest possible model which we can have. Should we take a small break, everybody? And feel free to ask questions. I mean, during the break or afterwards, I'm just going to put the recording on pause here. So what we're going to assume now is a simple model. And uh, as I said before the break, we can actually make it more complicated. We can have more features. So you could think of this representing a set of features. You could now have a, a, po a polynomial in X, or you could have many more features which represent your data set. So, but let's try to keep it as simple as possible. And we just leave it with uh, this kind of uh, uh, argument to the exponential. Okay. So the uh, thing which we are going to do now, based on this, what we are going to assume then is that the uh, P of X, so let's uh, do some small rewriting here. This is uh, something which we can now redefine as a probability of Y of I with a given X of I given a model beta. And this is what we also used when we uh, uh, derived ordinary least squares using a uh, normal distribution. We did the same approximation or not approximation, but we used the same approach when we looked at the derivation from a statistical point of view of region lasso regression. So the uh, model which we have for each one of these y's, the outputs, and we are going to assume that the y's are independent and identically distributed. So that means that the, the whole domain of events, when we have a domain which is now given by x0, y0, as before, x1, y1, etc., all the way up to the last data points which we have. What we are going to look at now is the probability of uh, D with a given beta. And we are now going to look after the beta which optimizes the probability. In our case, this means the, the beta, the estimator or the parameter, which gives us the maximum likelihood. And then we are going to put this one equal to the uh, product of all the individual probabilities, where we now have a P or Y of I, X of I with a given value of beta. Now, uh, what we have assumed is that Y of I's are independent and identically distributed. So that this is this kind of shorthand which is used in statistics, which is normally just spelled IID, independent and identically distributed events. And that's why we can set up a product of individual probabilities. Now, just to make life a little bit easier for myself, I'm actually going to uh, rewrite this in terms of uh, an i equals zero, and then I'm just gonna keep the argument p of x of i. So I'm just in the notation here, I'm just gonna write this as a p x of i. Now, uh, one of the things which we haven't looked at is what kind of distribution do the epsilons follow? So let's see if we can make uh, a model for that. So we have assumed that the y of i's are now given by this probability p of x of i plus epsilon of i. So let's now say that uh, if we have y of i equal to one, then we have a probability. So let's assume now that we define that probability p of x of i. Then if I have a probability or an event which is equal to zero, then the probability 
probability is given by 1 minus p of x of i. Probability is 1 minus p of x of i. And remember now that the, when I sum over all the probabilities, this is, since we have only two cases here, from 1, this should sum over p of uh, the different event, x of i, and in, they should sum up to 1. And I have a case when p of x of i is equal to, uh, gives of y of i equal to 0. And then I have the other case, which is the the p of i equal to zero. So what we have then, so this p of x of i is actually given, defined as y of i equal to one with a given x of i. And similarly, p one minus p of x of i is the same as p of y of i equal to zero with a given x of i. And when you, since you only have two possibilities here, it means that the one with y equal to zero has to be one minus the one when y of i is equal to one. I hope that sounds reasonable. So when I just use this constraint, which I have on the probabilities, that they are normalized, so that this quantity here, and I plug in the quantities, so I have a probability when y of i is equal to one, which is this px of i, then the other one has simply to be 1 minus px of i. So remember now that what I've said is that when y of i is equal to 1, the probability is equal to that. Okay? So the question now is, what kind of distribution does, does this parameter epsilon follow? Distribution or probability distribution what distribution does this epsilon follow? So in linear regression, we assume that epsilon follows a normal distribution. So let's look at uh, how we can actually find which distribution it should follow. So what we have, uh, if I take now y of i equal to one, then we have a probability p of x of i, and if I have y of i equal to one, well, that means, so if I look at this specific case, that means that what I have is one, so y of i is equal to one, and that's equal to p of x of i plus epsilon of i. And that means that my epsilon of i, in this case, is simply one minus p of x of i with probability p of x of i. If I take the next case and look at y of i equal to zero, then the probability is one minus this p of x of i. And what I have then is that epsilon, since y is equal to zero, is simply equal to minus epsilon of i, is simply p minus p x of i. And now, in order to avoid all these kind of subscripts, i's and so on, I'm just going to take away y of i and just replace that with y and x of i with x. So we're taking away all the subscripts. So let's just make life a little bit easier. And then we just write y equal to 1. We have a probability p of x. And we also have then that epsilon is equal to 1 minus p of x and y equal to zero, then we have one minus p of x, and epsilon is equal to minus p of x. Now what I can do now is to calculate the mean value for this epsilon, and since I only have two possibilities, you see immediately that it cannot be a normal distribution, right? And you probably are familiar with uh, many types of distributions which uh, can be used, or there's a famous distribution which can be used to describe this kind of binary case. And it will not be a surprise that this is gonna be the binomial distribution, which many of you probably have encountered already. But let's, let's uh, see that that's actually the case. So if I calculate the mean value of this parameter epsilon, 
what we have then, I have the probability of uh, y equal to one, and epsilon takes the value. So this is the value of epsilon in that specific case. And then it's multiplied with p of x, that's the probability, plus, and then I have the case, it actually comes with a minus, minus p of x, that's the value of epsilon. And this is multiplied with one minus p of x. And if I sum up, you can easily see that this becomes zero. So it has zero mean value, the way we have defined things. Then I can calculate the variance of epsilon. And in that specific case, what I'm gonna have now is the value squared. And remember now that the mean value is zero. Normally the variance is the value minus the mean value, but the mean value is zero. So I don't need to put that in, right? And then I get squared. And this is multiplied with P of X, which is a probability. And finally I have minus, and since again, the mean value is zero for epsilon, and this is multiplied with one minus P of X. And if you do the algebra, and now I'm just gonna set P of X equal to P here. If I do the algebra, this simply gives me P times one minus P, which is the variance for binomial distribution. So variance for binomial distribution. which is actually something you would expect for this kind of binary cases. So in this case, uh, the epsilons are not distributed according to a normal distribution, but they follow the binomial distribution, yeah? Oh, sorry, yeah, that's right. That's a plus there, thanks. That's, that's right. Yeah, it says plus in my notes. I was reading the wrong line, thanks. Okay, so the, uh, this is a way by which we can give an estimate of what this distribution looks like. So keep in mind that we have made a model for a binary distribution. Now let's now look at the equations which we uh, are going to get for the parameters beta. So what we have assumed now is that we have these probabilities given by this uh, sigmoid function. So we have a domain of events, beta of D with a given beta. So what we are going to assume now is the following. Since we now have the possibility of having, uh, so the PX of I, this stands for Y of I equal to one. So we write this as a power of to y of i, and then we have to multiply this with minus p of x of i to the power of one minus y of i. This is going to be the probability which encompasses these binary output. So you see now that if y of i is equal to one, then it's the first term. If y of i is equal to zero, then it's the second term which kicks in. So for every single event now, we have this as a model for the distribution, okay? So keep in mind now that we are just making models and we are going to replace this P of X now with this sigmoid function, or logistic function, as it's always as it's called. Then, since we want to do machine learning now, we are going to define the cost function or loss function in terms of uh, so the C of beta is now going to be given by the negative log of this probability PD of beta. And again, since we now have a negative log, we are going to find the optimal parameters beta in terms of a minimization problem of beta, which has now P possible entries of C or beta. So this is the same which we did in uh, linear regression. The only difference now is that we have a binary case and we have replaced a continuous function with a probability distribution. And, but still we have a model for
for the probability distribution. So we want now to optimize this problem, so we find the optimal estimators or parameters which describe the data in the best possible way. So everything we are going to do in this course actually follows this kind of recipe. So when you move into neural networks, your model is going to be the neural network. And you're still going to define a cost function in terms of the specific model which you choose. And then it's up to you to find the optimal parameters by the optimization problem. So uh, the reason, again, why we take the log of the function and we take the minimum, we could take the maximum if you wanted, the plus sign, but we take the log because then we just get a product of all these probabilities. So if you then uh, do the math here, what you're going to get is the following. So this uh, cost function is then going to be equal to minus, and then we have a sum instead of a product, i equals zero to n minus one, and we have y of i of L, ln p of x of i. So I'm using this shorthand p of x of i instead of bringing in all the parameters, beta and so on. And then we have plus inside the sum here, y of i, multiplied with the log of one minus p of x of i. Now, you can easily, <clears throat> in the case which I'm looking at, I'm looking at a case where y takes value 0 to 1, but there's nothing which hinders you to change it to minus 1 or plus 1. Then the distribution, if you use this logistic function, the distribution is pretty easy to actually find. Now, let's now uh, look at the, uh, uh, the, how this function is going to look like when we now plug in the equation for p of x of i. So just to remind you of that one, so this is going to have the form of beta plus beta x of i, beta 1, divided by 1 plus e of beta 0 plus beta 1 x of i. So when you plug that in, this is simply going to be equal to minus, and then you have a y equals 0 to n minus 1. There is a y of i. And then we have simply beta 0 plus beta 1 times x of i. And then we have a final term, which goes like minus ln of 1 plus e to the beta 0 plus beta 1 x of i, like this. So what I did now was simply to plug in the expressions for this function p, which is our model. It could be another function if you want to. There's nothing which hinders you to replace this probability with another one. And you will see that when we come to neural networks, that one of the parameters you get, in addition to what you have already as parameters, is actually the type of functions you can use for these probabilities. So it's a little bit disappointing. I actually had, I had a student who was so disappointed when he took the course in machine learning because he said that, Hey, but this is just us introducing tons of parameters and then trying to find the best possible fit. But some of these uh, are normally guided by your insights about the problem. So it's not that you just pick random parameters and fit them. Okay, so what you have now is a function which you can take the derivative of. And you see easily now that if you take the derivative of the uh, because now we want to optimize. So if we take the derivative with respect to the parameter beta zero, and we want that one to be zero, this becomes equal to minus, and then I have an i equal to zero, and it's actually not so difficult to see that, that this is what you're going to get, minus p of x of i. So when you take the derivative, just to remind you of that intermediate step, so the first term, if you look at this term here, that's pretty obvious. So that gives us y of i, right? When I take the derivative with respect to beta 0. Then, if you look at the next term, what you have to take the derivative of is d ln of 1 plus e of beta 0 plus beta 1 times x of i with respect to d beta 0. And we know that that is simply equal to 
E beta 0 plus beta 1 x of i, or 1 plus E of beta 0 plus beta 1 of x of i. And this is nothing but this P of x of i. So that's the first derivative. And then we want also the next derivative because we have another parameter, d beta one equal to zero. And it's also pretty easy to see that this one is only just slightly modified from the previous case. So it's gonna have an x of i and then a y of i minus p x of i, like this. So we're gonna, we can put the names on these. So these are going to be the gradients of the cost function. So we could call the function which you see here as G0, and then this function here as G1. So that's the gradient for derivative of respect to beta one, and the gradient with respect to the beta zero. Now, uh, now we can make this more compact if we want to. So in, in a general, in general matrix form and vector form, it's not so difficult to actually see that this DC of D beta equal to zero is equal to minus X transpose multiplied with Y minus P. And this is the same as X transpose of P minus Y. So this is a general gradient, and I'm just gonna put this as a G here. So I'm a little bit sloppy with vector signs. In the lecture notes, you will find this as bold phase quantities. So it follows a kind of tradition in statistical textbooks where often you can see statements like this that you can, from the context, you can figure out whether this is a scalar or a vector or a matrix. Sometimes it's a little bit frustrating, but now these are vectors. Okay. So uh, there is another thing which I'm gonna leave, you, leave to you as a small exercise, but let me quickly remind you. So P and Y, P is now and Y, they have dimensionality N, so length N, and then X of T, which is our design matrix, the transpose, it has dimensionality P times N. So the design matrix, we are following the same practice as before. And I'm going to give you a small exercise here. And this is actually a quite interesting exercise and it becomes important for us a little bit later. So if you now look at the second derivative of this D beta, D beta transpose, this is what we call the Hessian matrix. So this is called the Hessian matrix or just the Hessian. This is given in terms of X of T times W times X. So I'm gonna give you this as an exercise and remember now that in the, under the folder handwritten notes, you have this uh, solution to uh, this exercise five from week 35, where I go through the derivations of different uh, matrix derivatives and vector derivatives. So if you take a look at that handwritten note, you will see how you can calculate the second derivative here. But the thing which is interesting here is that this matrix W, so this matrix W has only diagonal elements, has only diagonal elements. It has a dimensionality, W has dimensionality N times N, and the diagonal elements, P are given by the probabilities, P of X of I multiply with one minus P of X of I. <clears throat> so these are the diagonal elements of that matrix. Now, this uh, is something which I'm gonna leave you as a small exercise, just to convince yourself. But the thing which is important now is keep in mind now that these probabilities are always larger or equal to zero. So that means that the quantities you find in this matrix are always positive quantities. Now, if you remember back to when we did this singular value decomposition of the matrix X transpose times X, 
we found that that is a matrix which is positive definite. When a matrix is positive definite, it means that the problem we are optimizing, since this matrix X transpose times this W times X is then also going to be a positive definite matrix, it means then, positive definite means that all eigenvalues are larger than zero. It means then, from an optimization problem, since this is given by the second derivative, that this is a problem which is a convex optimization problem, which has a global minimum. So in logistic regression, we are also going to have a matrix which is going to lead to a global minimum. So that is very assuring for the different parameters beta. And it's the same as we had in linear regression. So this uh, second derivative is then going to guarantee that the problem we are looking at is a convex optimization problem with, which has a global minimum. And that's pretty useful. That is not the case. It's not going to be the case when you're going to deal with neural networks. Then you have a multidimensional object and you may not know whether there is a global minimum or not. So the nice thing with both logistic and linear regression is that we can actually infer these type of properties from the equations which we get. Now, however, when you look at the equations which we have now for the gradient, so what we've said is that the gradient is now given by xt multiplied with p minus y, we have that the second derivative, h, is given by this matrix xt times this matrix w times x. So these are the quantities which we have. And now we want to find the optimal parameters beta. So we want beta. And I should write this as a g of beta here. And this is our h of beta. So when you now look at what we have, so we have g as a function of beta. Of beta. And the way we have the function of beta is actually given by x of t. So x does not have any dependence on beta but we have p, which actually depends on beta. So I'm putting the beta dependence in there, minus y. So y does not have a dependence on beta. That's just the data set which we have. Now, when you look at the expression which you have for p, so p now as a function of this beta here is actually given by this e of beta 0 plus beta 1 times x divided by 1 plus e of beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. So if you think back to linear regression, what kind of problem do you see here now? If you want a linear regression, we found a nice analytical solution to the, to the parameters beta. So if you look at your derivative now, and the derivative is something we want to have equal to 0, so we actually want that. That gives beta optimal when we have been able to fulfill that condition. So if you look at the equation, I mean, what's your feeling about these equations? Can we get an analytical solution, a nice one like we did in linear regression? Or you think there are problems? I, I, this was not intended, actually. Okay. Yeah. Say, say it again. Not necessarily. I mean, it is, it is a technical problem here for the solution. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I would like, since since we've been preaching about linear regression, I would very much like to have an analytical expression for the parameters beta. And remember now, linear regression, 
you had a linear dependence on beta. So the whole thing now is you don't have a linear dependence. So when you don't have a linear dependence on your unknown parameters, then it's very unlikely that you can find a analytical expression. So the problem we have to face now is that we have to solve these equations numerically. And there is a famous method for solving equations where you want to have the roots of a function. So we're actually looking at the roots of the function g or beta, which gives us zero. And there's a famous method uh, which is used, I mean, this perhaps one of the simplest methods which is used to find the roots of such a function. So we have a non-linear dependence on the parameters beta. So we can, in linear regression, the name linear regression comes from the fact that you have a linear dependence on the unknown parameters beta. And when you have a linear dependence, often we are able to find analytical solutions for the parameters. Now we have a non-linear dependence because we have an argument to an exponential. So which kind of method, if you look at the root finding, we have a g of beta, which we want to be zero. Which method, uh, have you met a method for solving this numerically? There's a famous method actually. Yeah? It's the Say again? It's the uh, not exactly the ABC formula. There's another method named after actually a famous physicist who lived 400 years ago. The, the physicist with the apples. Yeah, it's Newton method. So the, the kind of, the reason why I bring up Newton's method is that the, uh, the method is the one which is used as a starting point for basically all the gradient methods used in machine learning. So let's try to remind ourselves about Newton's method in one dimension. Let's do that first, okay? Because that's pretty useful. And then you will also see why we are going to introduce a parameter which will replace the second derivative. But that gives a new parameter in machine learning, which is called the learning rate. So let's look at Newton's method. We just remind ourselves quickly about the method. So there's a famous method, newton raphson actually. I think Raphson was the one who did the, all the practical calculations. So suppose you have a function f of s, and now we are looking at the one-dimensional case, one dim. And after that, we are going to extend to uh, more than one variable. So let's now look at the f of s. So this is the quest which we want. We want to find s, which gives us the roots of this function f. So Newton's method, the standard way, if you don't know anything, you tailor expand, okay? So if you tailor expand around this value s, so we tailor expand, So we have f of s is f of x plus the first derivative term, f first derivative plus, and then we have s minus x squared divided by two factorial and so on. Then we obviously hope that the second derivative term can be neglected. So we keep only the first derivative term. So what we do then, is simply now to approximate. So we approximate f of s with f of x plus s minus x of f of x. And then we can find the, the root of this equation. So this is given by s x minus f of x divided by f first derivative of x. That's Newton's method. Now, this is something you would solve by iterations. So you would start with a guess, and then you keep stepping till this uh, s, the left-hand side minus the right-hand side, is smaller than a certain convergence criteria you have chosen. That's the basic. So that means that this, when you solve this iteratively, so solve iteratively,
Then you would typically start with a guess, x0, and then continue till the difference between xn plus 1 minus xn, the absolute value of that one, is smaller than a certain number which you have chosen. That number could be 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 10, or whatever. So you have to opt for a convergence criteria. And this is given by uh, minus f of x divided by f of x here. Then you can extend this to uh, more variables. And when you have more variables, you need to rewrite everything in terms of vectors and matrices. So let's suppose now we are looking at our convergence criterion for the parameters beta, which we have here. So one thing we need to define also is actually the, if we look at the secondary, in our case, this f of x goes over to the gradient. That means g of beta. And that means that this f derivative is actually this Hessian matrix, h of beta. So this h of beta with two parameters only, with beta 0 and beta 1, what we have then is that this matrix h of beta is then given by the derivative of the gradient g0, as we defined previously, with respect to beta 0. That's the diagonal element. And we have another diagonal element, g1, of d of beta 1. And then we have a d g0 with respect to beta 1. And then we have d g1 with respect to beta 0. So that's the Hessian matrix when we have more than just one unknown parameter. And clearly, if you have 10 parameters, this becomes a 10 times 10 matrix. If you have 100 parameters, 100 times 100, and so on. And now you see the complications, right? Because if I now want to apply Newton's method for these beta 0 and beta 1, so if I want, if I want to use Newton's method now, in this specific case, what we are ending up with is then the following. So we are going to have, now it's a vector, so we have the vector beta 0, iteration n plus 1, and beta 1 of n plus 1. And this is equal to the previous value. So we have a beta 0 of n. And we typically start with a guess here. And often this guess can be random values if we don't have any idea. Or we may have some intelligent assumptions about the system. And this contains now minus. And now it contains this Hessian matrix, the inverse of that one. And that's calculated beta 0 in iteration n and beta 1 in iteration n. And it's multiplied with a vector, the gradient vectors, g calculated at beta 0 of n of beta 1 of n, and g1 at beta 0 of n and beta 1 of n. And now you see why the, uh, uh, the, in machine learning, when you're dealing with this kind of approaches, so Newton's method is actually the basic methods. All the things which we are going to see are going to be approximations to Newton's method, which again is an approximation to the way you find the optimal values. Remember now that Newton's method takes into account only the first order term in the Taylor expansion. You neglect higher derivatives. So we already made an approximation using Newton's method. In machine learning, this is essentially the starting point for all kinds of optimization methods, except that now you would like to avoid evaluating this term. You, because you're going to calculate these gradients tons of times. I mean, this case with two 
parameters only is what we normally call a baby case. And you have few data sets, the matrix is a two by two matrix. You know, you can even calculate a matrix analytically, the, the matrix you want to invert. You know how to calculate the inverse of a matrix, a two by two matrix. So you could actually plug that in. But this is actually a trivial case. In general, you have hundreds or thousands of tens of thousands of parameters. And that means that you don't want to calculate an inverter matrix, which is a 10,000 times 10,000. And since you're doing typically hundreds of iterations, so for every iteration, you're actually inverting a matrix, which is, let's say, 10,000 times 10,000. And then you do 100 iterations, so you do 100 times matrix inversions of 10,000 times 10,000. Because you have to evaluate these quantities again and again. So you have to calculate this one with the new parameters beta. You have to calculate this with the new parameters beta. And then you continue till you have found the optimal values. And typically, the kind of convergence criterion which is set up. So your convergence, the standard convergence criterion. Should use criteria because now we have a vector. That is that beta of n plus 1 minus, and now this is a vector containing all the parameters, is smaller than a specific value epsilon, which can be something, let's say, 10 to the minus 10, just to give you an example. So it means that you may end up with doing tons of iterations, and you don't want to invert the matrix again and again and again. Matrix inversion is expensive. It goes like uh, the dimensionality with a square matrix, n cubed, it goes like n cubed floating point operations. So if you have 10,000 type 10,000 matrix, it means that you're doing actually 10,000 to the power of three floating point operations. Every time you have new parameters beta and you want to avoid that. So how do we avoid that? What's the simplest way of avoiding it? Yeah. Say it again. Yeah, but what would you replace the don't invert with? What's the simplest way you can actually replace a, a quantity with? One is one. Yeah. Or constant. And that's what is done normally. And that leads to a method which is called gradient descent. And what you do then, when you replace with a constant, you need to do like the hyperparameter lambda, you replace that with a grid of choices. And then you find the mean squared error, which gives you, or the parameter for this second derivative, which gives the best mean squared error. And that's cheaper computationally because you are going to have tons of features, which means that your gradient is going to be pretty multidimensional. And it's cheaper to actually calculate these gradient iterations with a fixed parameter than inverting a matrix. So the kind of way we are going to do it, and this is where we're going to stop today. So what we are going to do now, and now I'm writing this as a vector, so beta n plus 1, New iteration is given by the old iteration of n minus a parameter gamma and multiplied with the gradient calculated for iteration n. And this parameter is called the learning rate. And this is a new parameter in machine learning. And you will typically tune that parameter so that you obtain the best possible mean square errors or the best possible reproduction of your data set. And this is, and actually, if you can find ways to improve these calculations, uh, you're going to get many more friends. When I say this, it doesn't mean I don't infer that you don't have friends, but you will get many friends, many more. Actually, this is one of the big issues in machine learning, and you will find tons of methods which actually try to make smarter approximations to these
constant gamma. So if you want your name in the annals of machine learning, if you cook up something smart here, that's guaranteed they will, you will. Actually, the, one of these papers has more than, there's a method which is called ADAM, adaptive uh, uh, momentum gradient method. It has more than 100,000 citations. That just sets the scene. My best paper has only 1,000 citations, which is pretty good. I mean, a good scientific paper has 100 citations. This papers, one of the methods on these kind of ways of speeding up the optimization has more than 100,000 citations. That says everything. Okay, guys. Any questions? So this is really what you see here is the half of all problems, right? Of machine learning, because this is what you end up doing again and again and again. Okay, let's take a break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.